one, zero. We have commit and we have lift off at 2.13. And it has cleared the tower. Prepare yourself for a world of sacrifices. This is Good morning, everybody. Conley here with the Science Night in the morning. Yep. Well, Thomas Schiller is uh, out on the field. Uh, literally looking uh, for some rocks and dinosaur bones, and he's probably, uh, you know, just chipping away with his pickaxe there. Then we have Honor Bond Bhattacharjee, probably on a plane right now from India. We'll be hearing from him sooner rather than later. But right now, all the way from Australia, we have Dr. Sean Graham in the house. Uh, Sean, how's it going? Real good, man. Well, doing good. It's, it's getting to be summertime here. It's beautiful. Really? Summertime there, and it's uh, full-fledged fall. We're falling back uh, tomorrow by one hour. Do y'all do that, too? Do y'all do daylight savings? They do, and, and it's weird. It's at a different time, so we, we did it um, a little while ago, and so we are – I forget already what, we, what we've what we done, um, but I think it was darker than it was before in the morning when I was getting up. I can't remember, but, yeah, they do daylight savings here, too. Wow. But it's on the it's up op, it's on the opposite schedule, you know. Yeah. Um yeah. Different time of year. Well, uh we have a good show for you. Tonight is a very big night. There is a Canelo Alvarez fight and there's a UFC fight tonight. Most Saturdays there's some kind of fights going on. But you know, it got me thinking. It got me thinking, wow, we are absolutely in ca- like just uh in awe when two people fight each other and there, mm. there's there's some kind of beauty to this chaos that the controlled chaos in a ring when you have two competitors go in and try to make basically make the other one quit or give up or separate them from their consciousness and we're going to kind of <laughs> go back to the animal kingdom and kind of go back to some of the methods that they use for combat and I, and I thought it'd be a really fun episode. I was thinking about, uh, Sean, you know a lot about uh, combat in the animal kingdom or just animals in general. And uh, I don't know if there's any favorite animals you'd want to, uh, you know, kind of touch on uh, in this episode. I do know that, uh, you know, the female praying mantis, her favorite uh, method of uh, disposal is decapitation by dinner, I believe. Right. Yeah. So are we talking about uh, f- fighting aggression in nature, or are we? Because what the um, what the praying mantis female does oh, is yeah. a little different. Yeah, that's, that's for right. totally different purposes. Yeah, okay. that, that's totally right. Because the 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 male actually he's he's just cool with it. Yeah, he, he donates his head and the rest of his body, <laughs> and and that's awesome. It's so hilarious. I once uh, one of my favorite things I ever found in nature was I found a female praying mantis with a male in copulo. I, the male was attached to her Ooh. with his little, uh, you know, praying mantis organ inside of her. Whoa. Without a head. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> man, he's going to wake. he's going to wake up with a. With a big surprise in the morning. Yeah, uh, yeah. But, uh, and, and people, you know, this is one of those classic examples of where it seems to not make any evolutionary sense of why that would happen. But if a male way back in the, you know, the glimmer days of praying mantis uh, behavior, it, if he gets eaten by the female, she has more energy to make more eggs. And so she has more babies. And so he ends up having more babies with a female that eats him. Same thing with black widows. Black widows do the same thing. They eat. They eat the male. So the male not only donates his sperm, he donates himself to, it's a nuptial gift. It allows her to make more babies. And so it works. Wow. Wow. So, uh, well, let me tell you, it, it, a lot of, and babies really kind of uh, are the central theme around why so many animals are aggressive, right? And, and uh, like, uh, so they fight to keep their offspring to continue to go or they fight for food right for their own right 
but you know, and it's, it, I'm going to, I'm going to stop you right there with a the kind of first misconception um, is the first misconception is that animals fight a lot and they don't. Oh, really? Huh. Yeah. They're capable of fighting. That's true. Uh, but animals actually, a lot of the stuff that you see. So here's, here's an example. If you go around watching grizzly bear behavior, yeah, um, you're going to see very few grizzly bears um, fight. You, that's actually rare. Now, when a nature show finds that and films two big gr male grizzlies or a female grizzly attacking a male because her cub is around, of course, that's what they're going to show because it's sensational. It's unbelievable. It's super cool. Yeah. And human humans, of course, as you're implying, especially male humans, have this weird predilection to watching fights. And so we want to watch that. So that's the stuff they show. They don't show all the you know, thousands of interactions between grizzlies where they just kind of snort at each other and they go in separate directions. They don't show where a male grizzly scratches a tree and advertises its area to other male grizzlies who then look at that tree and just turn around and walk the other way. And that's mainly what mammals and many other animals do. They reduce conflicts. It actually makes more sense to have stereotype behaviors that reduce the chances that they ever get into the fight. And then the fight is a last resort. Hmm. And that's, and, and actually that, that explains a lot of what you're talking about in terms of our uh, fascination with the UFC and with college football, right? Yeah. Oh, we yeah, said it sure. before in this show that part of that is we love it uh, probably because it helps to reduce our stress and reduce the tension and it reduces our likelihood of actually getting in a fight ourselves. Wow. Right? It, a lot of people have argued that no watching violent movies makes you more prone to going out and, you know, doing likewise, but I would almost guarantee it's the other way around. Somehow you get some sort of weird satisfaction out of watching, you know, somebody do something that you could never ever do without going to jail. You know, you watch the movie where the guy gets in a bar fight to save his girlfriend's, you know, chastity or something like that. Sure. Beats the living crap out of 15 dudes, you know, yeah. with, without, you know, so and that just feels so good. You're like, yeah, I wish I could do that. Nobody ever does that. That's if true. they do, they go straight to jail, you know? Yeah. yeah. Even if it was fairly justified, they're, they're going to see something. They're going to get thrown in jail for at least overnight. Uh, I mean, lucky. I don't know. It depends on if you live in, in Sanderson or not. But um, yeah, yeah, yeah. Anyway. In West Texas, you got a pretty good chance. Yeah, probably of the judge just going, "Well, were you defending yourself, son? Okay, you're, we're going to let you, but you're going <laughs> to spend the go. night in the tank at least. Yeah, you might until they sort yeah. it out. That's true. But in in the movies, nothing happens. They just drive on to the next town, <laughs> and it's satisfying. And I think that's part of it. Is the same thing. Well, let's talk about because okay, all right. Well, I mean. This it pops a little bubble of mine because I always yeah. thought that Mufasa and Scar fights <laughs> were like commonplace in the in the in the yeah. pride of lions, you know, that, in, in yeah, my that's, little that's, five year old yeah. head of mine. Yeah. And, and, you know, fights between lion prides are probably super uncommon. Wow. But it, it, you do bring on something that's pretty interesting. Yeah. Um, the hierarchy. You know, the, 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 the subtext between, and I've actually never seen the lion king. You're going to, you're going to hate oh. me. But uh, I, I'm sure I will soon because I've got kids now. We'll watch it. But there's a subtext, I think, in that between lions and hyenas that's really interesting. Right? Hmm. Yeah, oh, yeah, for sure. You yeah. tell me. I've never seen it. I know there's hyenas and they're kind of the villains, right? Well, the hyenas are like the henchmen of uh, Scar, the the right. bad lion. And and yeah. the thing is that Mufasa <laughs> okay. is the king. He He's the king of the lions or whatever. He's Jesus. Apparently, uh, in some kind of metaphor, and yeah. and and uh, and Scar is like the bad guy, and his henchmen are all the hyenas, and they're all hanging around okay. him, and he sends them to do like different jobs and stuff. It's a really cool show. You definitely uh, should uh, check it out. Yeah, I want to watch it. But the hyenas I, you know, definitely are been, there. I, I've been convinced that they that part of that was based on a really sensational documentary that everybody should watch. They came out a few years before The Lion King came out. It was classic National Geographic, one of the best documentaries of all time. And it really shows what you want to see. Yeah. It shows big, nasty fights 
and and battles between eternal enemies. In fact, I think that's the name of the documentary is Eternal Enemies. And it's Whoa. between hyenas and lions. And it and it's real. Whoa. Um and the basic premise is that you know lions are more or less day active predators on the savanna. They're diurnal. And oh. hyenas are night active. And so during the day, hyena or lions pretty much have the edge on hyenas. And you know, if you were just watch them all the time during the day, you would assume that lions um, have the upper hand all the time, and li- uh, hyenas are kind of of a subservient predator. Yeah, you know, that just feast on you know what's left of a lion's kill, and the lions you know chase them away. At night, the tables turn, and hyenas have the upper hand, mm. and lions generally spend the days in the trees to get to avoid these huge packs of social hyenas that can tear them apart. Wow, and it's it's incredible. There's some vicious fights. And it and it's amazing. It's a really good example. I always use it in my ecology class of an example of what we call interspecific competition. Huh. That's competition between two species. Wow. And a lot of what we think, uh, you know, causes differences among closely related species is probably competition that happened in the evolutionary past that's resulted in a little bit of a kind of more of a balance kind of thing where things aren't constantly fighting. They're not fighting over the same foods because they've either started to eat slightly different foods to reduce competition, or they've started to actually change their shapes so that they can eat different foods. And that's the that competition between species is largely, you know, assumed to cause diff- major differences among species. It's part of the reason why we have so many species. But this is one, you know, it's hard to actually demonstrate competition happening like right now. Like we always assume it must have happened in some time in the distant past, but we don't actually see examples of two species duking it out brutally on the savanna. But this documentary shows it very well. Wow! It shows it. Yeah, it, it, it's going on and it's brutal. It's 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 the kind of thing that you most people assume is going on all the time in nature, but it's it's hard to document actually. And this is this is a really great document, and I'm pretty sure. It must have inspired whoever came up with the Lion King. They probably watched that documentary and thought, oh, man, this would make a great cartoon. (laughs) For kids, yeah, for sure, for sure. They definitely have uh, some biblical kind of references to it. I mean, but uh, what's interesting about that is like what you're talking about, the actual documentary, is that, you know, in, in fighting, we have two fighters. And both of those fighters kind of hone their skills perfectly to not only be the best apex athlete that they can be but also they do months and months and months and sometimes even years of research on their opponent so when they Mm. both get in the ring they almost know each other it's a beautiful it's a waltz because they know each other so well that's what makes it really beautiful when you're watching it i'm a i'm a definitely a student of the game but uh, i'm a i'm a lifelong fan of combat sports and um man let me tell you if you have two really really honorable highly skilled individuals in there that really know each other it's almost like watching choreographed dancing but it's all real it's all ap- absolutely as real as it gets and uh it seems how does the co of evolution uh mm. happen between the hyenas or, or any other like two different species yeah. That's great. Yeah, that's a good segue and a good kind of metaphor. Um, And it's very similar. I I feel the same way. Like some of the greatest superlatives in nature are the result of coevolution between predators and their prey. Mm. So if you think about like the fastest land mammal, the cheetah. Yeah. Coevolution. It has to be that much faster. It's harder to actually chase than to be chased. And so the Impala can be 50 miles an hour, right? but it's got the advantage of it knows where it's going to be in the next two seconds, or it can decide to change directions. Mm. And the cheetah has to, you know, maybe anticipate that move, but also it has to be able to be that much faster to where when the Impala jukes, it jukes with it and has to be that much faster to close the distance. So it's slightly faster or else the cheetahs would have starved to death and gone extinct a long time ago. Wow. And the Impala constantly, you know, is just a little bit, 
you know, they're incredible running machines too. And they're super, uh, you know, constantly on the lookout, very wary. Uh, it, it's made the Impala an incredible machine. And, you know, as well as some of the smaller gazelles that, that go after. Well, wait, the wait, Peregrine hold on. Falcon. You're, you're, I'm, I'm envisioning when you say an Impala, an Impala is an incredible machine. Like, what's the mile per gallon? What does this thing look like? Is it a four door? Is it a sedan? Oh. Is it? What? Yeah. So it's not the Chevy Impala. Oh. I mean, that was a bad example. Okay. Uh, this this is a, 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 a antelope that's a little bit larger than a gazelle. Oh. So there's okay. like there's like gazelles are maybe. Uh, you know, I've never actually seen one in person, um, and I don't even know if I, I picture them as about the size of a terrier or maybe a golden retriever. Uh-huh. And the Impala is a little bit bigger than that, a little taller. And that's that's a typical prey item for leopards who get them by an incredible uh, ability to sneak yeah. and to pounce from hiding, which is just as amazing as what cheetahs can do. And cool. cheetahs will run down them and gazelles, small, slightly smaller, uh, by sheer sprinting capability they have to sneak too but they can they can start their you know dance their run at a much greater distance than something like a leopard can oh and actually, i see and actually go and then you've got things like the wild dogs african wild dogs which aren't a type of dog they're in a totally separate you know genus from you know wolves and and jackals and everybody else um those guys uh, are cooperative hunters that do it by endurance running not unlike, you know, human endurance runners that we picture might have done some running like this and run down their prey. They don't run down their prey to exhaustion. They run them down. They do get exhausted, but they can run them down and, and do, use teamwork uh, to kind of run off and run down animals and eventually get them. So, you know, three separate ways of doing things. And all these predators have have become exceptional at, at their abilities like superheroes yeah. through the co-evolutionary process. Every time the Impala gets a little bit faster, the cheetah has to get a little bit faster. And so fast forward 2 million years and you got the fastest land mammal. Wow. Um, peregrine falcons, fastest thing alive. They have to, um, you know, dive bomb very fast birds uh, that have an ability to fly very, very well and you're going to laugh at the typical prey item uh, of a peregrine falcon because they don't get much credit, but they're very fast and very maneuverable. Pigeons. Uh oh, the pigeon. Yeah. Pigeons are they have their wings are shaped nearly like a peregrine falcon for the same reason. They're awfully quick <laughs> when they need to be, and uh, the peregrine falcon has to be able to kind of zoom down from you know, and go 250 miles an hour on a dive bomb and smack the thing right out of the air. So all these, all these things that can do amazing things got that way through that process. Wow. Yeah. And if you, you just kind of imagine the species, right? You, you take a, you take a particular species full of like, you know, not really inferior, but a diverse you know, a diverse skill set across the whole entire species, none, none really better than the other, except for that one small percentage. And then you just kind of crank that time scale, like a few yep. hundred years, even a few hundred years or a few thousand years. And then they all start getting better and better and sharper and sharper. They all start looking like that 1%. Now the 1% that was there 200 years ago or 300 years ago, they're the majority. And then yeah. the one percent yep. is even better. That's so it. you're you sharpening just, the a, tip of the spear every time. That's right. You just explained natural selection um, in a way that I think anybody could understand it. And when you explain it that way, people are less likely to go, "No, no, that is, that couldn't." You know, it's like that's exactly it. That it's a it's a bell shaped curve distribution. There's that tail end towards one end, and and that that one end is kind of getting pushed over farther and farther to the right or the left and it's it's making yeah imagine if if here's here's an analogy it's ridiculous imagine if your ultimate fighting championship dudes were the only people in our population who were reproducing oh dude yeah like for some reason you know think of uh, people often use this example like a zombie apocalypse you know those guys would do pretty well in the zombie apocalypse they'd be breeding and so imagine a hundred thousand years of that everybody would look like Joe Rogan. We'd run out of tattoo ink. (laughs) (laughs) 
and we'd be probably a little bit dumber but you know <laughs> probably probably but yeah. now now the the true masters like joe rogan <laughs> won't admit it he's not an a mma fighter but uh or Joe Rogan will admit it that he's not the sharpest tool in the shed, but uh, no, the true masters <laughs> are highly intelligent. That uh, one you're one right, fight today, right. the guy was a lawyer. I mean, but he just yeah. did it because he loves it, and it there's, yeah, there's an a art lot of intellectuals. It. It's a weird kind of weird fight club going on because like Joe Rogan's got in his orbit people like Sam Harris and yeah, oh yeah, <laughs> he, he, you know, Lex he's Frieden, doing the, uh, the 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 right. engineer, the AI engineer, the guy who designs yeah. AI. It's great. But uh, yeah, so okay, we're about to uh, get to a commercial break. After the break, uh, we're going to continue talking about combat within the animal kingdom, but there sh should be only one holding the scepter, Sean, right? Mm, I think I know and where you're going with this. How, how, are, how are we going to decide which one holds that scepter in our little tribe that we have? So we're going to talk about that after the break. All right, we are back, everybody. Science night in the morning. Sean Graham uh, calling in all the way from Australia. It is uh, nice, bright, and early in the morning, uh, just like it is here. And uh, there, there's a time space uh, continuum going on. I don't know how exactly <laughs> to explain that. But uh, anyway, we're here. We're having fun. We're talking about uh, animal combat, like uh, co trials by combat in the animal kingdom. And uh, Sean, uh, we were talking off camera while ago, off air, um, about the hierarchies of some animals. Some animals, they have, uh, when we think about our own kingdoms, like in the UK, do, what, what does Australia have? Do they like, what, what do they worship? <laughs> <laughs> you mean like, uh, is it a, a democracy? Kiwi? Is, is it like a, a kiwi or something? It's, it's a medieval monarchy where there's a king. Oh, and okay. He decides who gets to um, live and die. At, you know, it's funny. <laughs> they do. It, it, it is still part of what's called the Commonwealth of the UK. So, or something like that. I'm still not sure I understand. I'll give you a couple examples. It, they, people have pictures of the queen in their house in yeah. Australia. Really? And the queen, the queen is on the money here, which I laugh at every time I see it. But they've they've gotten autonomy from England to the point where it's all just kind of superficial now. Like that's all there is. Is like they've got the queen on their money. They you know the, if there's anything going on with the royal family, it's in the news here, and people kind of care about it. But it's in a kind of joking way for most people. They're like, oh, what's the queen up to? They don't really care. Yeah. And then here's here's the funniest thing to me, which I think people, especially in Texas, will think is hysterical is that <laughs> there's something called crown land in Australia. Crown the, land. The, crown land. England claims there's property, a bunch of it here in Australia, that the, the crown still uh, claims is theirs because they found Australia. <laughs> wow. And in order to get that land, an Australian would have to buy it from the United Kingdom. Whoa. Can you imagine? I can't imagine that. Like, yeah. that's weird. I guess yeah. they could do PayPal nowadays, but I don't know. Yeah. They... So, like, they haven't just said, oh, yeah, by the way, all this property that you guys think you own, we own it because it's our country. They oh, haven't done man. that. And they never did, like, an armed, you know, insurrection to get rid of the English. It was all just kind of done peacefully and over time, piece by piece. So, like, okay, you know what? We used to, if you guys went to war, we had to send a certain number of troops. We're not doing that anymore. So they like their military is completely autonomous from the UK now. UK has the UK a military. Get, if the UK, if the UK gets in a war, uh, Australia isn't going to send any troops unless you know they want to. But the UK has, uh, or I mean the uh, the uh, Australia, Australia Australia has some uh, military. Force. Hell yes, they they've got they they like fought with our guys in Afghanistan. Koala bears with the with the helmets. No man. They bought our. They've got like five F thirty fives that they bought off of us. Dang, um, cool! And, and they're buying. They, they're buying more, and they're buying nuclear submarines from us, go. which the the public in Australia is not very happy about. But well, you know what? They, we brought combat yeah. to a whole new level. Whenever we involved baby, we, we're we're playing with uh, <laughs> we're playing with toys now. But, yeah, uh, but you wanted to know what kind of hierarchies there are in the animal kingdom, right? Yeah, I do. I do want to know about that. That That's very interesting. Last hour or last uh, segment, we were talking about 
you know, the coevolution of, uh, you know, the animals and even us too. Right. And how all that works. But now, I mean, there is a structure, a social structure in uh, a lot of these because, you know, we have to stick together to survive. And yes. uh, we have all we have to all play our roles in some ways. And there can only be one strongest agent in the tribe. Uh, it seems like we're going away from that in a lot of ways here, at least in the U.S. Like, it seems like our leaders couldn't fight, you know, at all or even strategize for that matter, uh, you know, in, in any kind of war, uh, sadly. But um, but in, in the animal kingdom, usually I, I'm not sure. I'm not sure. I would think that the leader, you know, the chieftain, you know, would be the apex, be the one, you know, and then hmm. you have to, yeah. that, that young up depends. and comer, the hungry one, you know, comes up and they battle it to see who gets, uh, who's top chimp. Yeah. So in social animals, uh, there is, there is a lot of that. It's, it's all kind of, there aren't very complicated societies in, in a lot of our mammal, uh, you know, kin. Hmm. Um, and like what you just described, like a wolf pack or a chimpanzee troop, right. you know, yeah. generally uh, maybe in a wolf pack is, Typically, the dominant male and female, they have sole reproductive rights. They uh, defend their rights to be the reproductive animals in the, in the pack uh, at the point of death. They will savage another, you know, uh, individual if they're trying to, uh, you know, and, you know, food rights, all of it. All of it is kind of theirs and everybody else is just kind of ha hanging along and, and, uh, and helping. When they get older, of course, maybe a young upstart takes over the leadership role, maybe an individual from outside the pack. So there is a lot. And it's all, it's all you know, that that kind of social system, the alpha, omega, alpha, beta, omega system or the alpha system in wolves is pretty well known. And it, it's it's found in some of the other cooperative hunting, uh, you know, predators. Not too dissimilar to the way it works with silverback gorillas. You know, a, a male, dominant male kind of has ownership over his harem. And, um, you know, woe be the juvenile male that tries to get in there with any of that. He's going to get pummeled. So it's pretty similar. And honestly, you know, human societies were a lot like that for a long time, probably for the largest part of our, of our time on Earth hunter gatherer tribes weren't too dissimilar from that. That's, that's kind of the, and I think a lot of our social woes that we have now, I've always kind of thought that it derives from the fact that we, we operate pretty well in a small group of maybe, you know, 25 to 30, maybe up to 50 people, most of whom are going to be pretty close relatives. And when you then put, put, a person who's that's kind of what your brain is set up to do in a, in a city with two and a half million people. Yeah. I'm not sure how that, that doesn't work. It doesn't work for me. I hate it. Yeah. I don't, I'm not I anybody work, out I, here I, would say the yeah. same thing. That's why we're out here. Yeah. I, I, I think I operate pretty well in a small group and big group, like big groups gross me out going to concerts and all that humanity. <laughs> so yeah. <laughs> Uh, but I'm, you know, obviously I'm, I'm in the minority, uh, because a lot of people love doing that kind of thing. Yeah. Most people do, it seems like. So, hmm. so maybe, yeah. So I've always, I don't know that that's, that's cool. But yeah, the, you know, some, some animals are actually even more social than humans. They've kind of taken it even farther. So like ants and bees in their colonies yeah, where they've, they've written, you know, they've stratified society. So so crazily that like there's a single reproductive female wow, and she's yeah, got all queen. these sterile, sterile drones and warriors that look, look after her pups for her wow. and go out and gather food. And the only, you know, the only ones who are actually sexually reproducing would be her for a long time. And then she'll make a crop of sexually reproducing males and females that them scatter. She'll to make the wind. them. Yeah, and she like through hormones, she can decide what kind of brood she's going to make. What? I mean, she she, wow. she doesn't decide. I mean, she's an ant. She's got a brain the size mm -hmm. of a you know a flea. But yeah, the behavior and the uh, when I say decision, it's kind it's of an programmed, really. Yeah, yeah, it's all kind of the genetic program exactly.
but yeah, they they're through different kind of hormone manipulations. They can make different broods and it's obviously a very successful, uh, kind of program because, you know, ants have taken over. Yeah. They're, they're very successful. They, they can easily dominate a small non-colonial species. Um, so, you know, that, that's the advantage is that it, it's certainly, they've left behind lots of progeny. And, wow. you know, civilization and humans has done the same thing. You know, these big civilized groups through coordination, cooperation have nearly drawn, uh, it, there, it, we'll probably see in our lifetime, no more hunter-gatherer groups in our lifetime. Really? Wow. They'll all be gone. They're almost there. I mean, there's a few left, but it won't take much before they're all gone. Man. So, uh, so like th those indigenous groups that are in South America that really haven't ever seen any kind of technology or, or plane or, or anything like that have literally been separated, you know, throughout the thousands of years, right. From I everything, uh, they, you see them kind of going away, huh? Yeah. Well, there's, yeah, that's, that's one area where there's a few left and then, um, Southern Africa, New Guinea. I mean, I think I just exhausted the list. That's I know, it. right? It's a short you know, list. And, and, but if yeah, we start giving list. all these countries iPhones, man, who are we going to go to when we forget to know how to hunt and gather? <laughs> well, you know, I mean, yeah, we can't well, just order it off, yeah. uh, off, uh, uh, you know, DoorDash, you know, whenever DoorDash, yeah. uh, it shuts down, who are we going to go to, to teach us how to hunt and gather? Yeah, once we once we've extinguished the last hunter gatherer people, and and you know not and it won't be like a, a direct, it doesn't have to be a direct thing, right? Yeah, that's not where a lot a lot of them went from direct, uh, you know, genocide, which is horrible. Yeah, but it, you know, it's not that's not gonna that's not going to be what causes the end of those cultures. It's going to be the rainforest around them will be destroyed, um, or they'll hear about the great things of the city and they'll leave. Uh, that's, that's what's happening to most of them right now. Wow. And so, you know, they want the best life for their own children. And, and if they're sick of only living to be 35 and dying of, you know, um, terrible diseases and malnutrition, they're going to leave anyway. Wow. You're right though. W once we've gone down this pathway, you know, we can't go back. Right. I know the door's <laughs> closed. We, That's what we I'm have saying. lost. We have lost all that knowledge of how to take care of ourselves from, from scratch. Right. And exactly. So if the iPhones do die and you know, if electricity just stops or if all of our food crops, something happens to them, we're going to be in big trouble. We are going to, there will be no meek to inherit the earth if you want to put it in that sense. But, <laughs> there you uh, go. <laughs> but anyway, okay. So that, that's a, that's a good segue though, into our next, uh, into our next thing. So, um, are there any animals out there that duel for sport? Like I see the goats all the time. They're just yeah. like going, going to town, baby. They are just, and, and it, yeah. is it for, that male dominance to spread your seed is, is it for that? Um, I know usually, the kangaroos, yeah. uh, in yeah. Australia, they do crunches and push ups, and they literally work out like humans and they are yeah. ripped, dude. They're ripped. They're ripped. And they fight yeah, each that, other. That, that's generally what it is for. And so there's, and, and a lot of it is like, I'm going to, I'm not going to backpedal what I said a, a little while ago and say that, Oh, actually they don't fight a lot. The, a lot they do fight and it's always ritualized like that oh right? it is ritualized not, okay cool yeah yeah yeah, yeah. so like uh the, even with a the kangaroo they're punching and, and going crazy and all that but it's there are rules they they do it a certain way they're not gonna um kind of cheat like a, a kangaroo is capable of slashing with its claws mm -hmm. and really doing some damage if a kangaroo thought of it, it could it could probably disembowel another male kangaroo with a really aggressive scratch. Wow. But they don't do that. It's it's all pretty stereotyped. Uh bighorn sheep, they're <laughs> they're capable of they could easily kill an adult human if they headbutted you. That's wow. how powerful that that um you know clash is. Um and Generally, though, they do it for a long time. It does make them more vulnerable to getting killed by a predator after they've done the fight. Right. The fights do not result. They're not fights to the death, generally. Now, there are sure. such things. It does happen. But 
you can kind of see how this would work, right? I'll give you a pronghorn, which you guys should all know about. Beautiful oh, yeah. animals there on the West Texas prairie. Um, a strictly North American mammal. They're not actually true antelopes like the ones in, in Europe and Asia. They're, they're a distinctly North American hoofed mammal found only in North America. Amazing. And they fight with those prong horns, and sometimes it is to the death. But it's it's rare, and you can imagine how that would work. If if a male dies during combat, he won't leave behind any more babies, right? Right. So this is how it gets evened out over time. Maybe at the beginning, when prong horn were going crazy, they were killing each other left and right, and only the ones that would kind of immediately come to a draw and figure out who the winner was pretty quickly. Those would be, have a better chance of leaving behind babies. The ones that fought to the death or fought to complete exhaustion got picked off by a predator. Wow. And so that's how this works. It, it, it eventually becomes fairly stereotyped and it, and, and it becomes these kind of fake fights. Yeah. Um, not unlike, you know, UFC, there are rules. It's kind of ruleless, but there are rules. You can't go in there with a, a knife. Right. Right. No, no, no. And they, it's and they stop the fight. Yeah. They stop the fight before somebody gets their face caved in. Right. Sure. Yeah, uh, exactly. And, and you can tap out. There's rules. Uh -huh. Same thing in the animal kingdom. That, These rules come about. That is really interesting. And who are the spectators? Like who in the tribe are like, because we, you know, in humans, there's a ton of spectators. Now, I yeah, know that's interesting. I have literally seen uh, not even joking. Two of uh, all dads go at mm -hmm. it with an audience of vultures. <laughs> it's absolutely crazy. It's like the That's vultures great. are waiting for one of them to fall. Yeah. And I yeah. don't know. Vultures. It's just sense. weird. Yeah. Vultures and coyotes, uh, mountain lions. No. So a lot of <laughs> this would be a really cool area for research because I've, you only see these things occasionally, but some of these things fight enough to where you could probably figure it out. But, you know, whether or not the females are watching the results of these fights, or if it's just a passive thing where the male who wins then kind of gets the females. Yeah. And she, they just kind of accept the fact that he's the dominant male. That's a really good question. And I'm honestly, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to plead ignorance on that one and say that I'm not sure. I, I know I don't know. But I'm not sure if anyone knows. Yeah, there, yeah. There, well, it there definitely probably, sparks there curiosity. There probably is some research. Yeah, there's some research out there. I'll bet, but I'm not sure if it's like, um, you know, we don't teach it in in our classes. Like, oh yeah, by the way, the females are watching. Um, <laughs> you know, male male snakes fight over access to females, and there are really cool examples of where there was a a, a bystander. There was an audience. A female was there like a couple of begs, otters or something and yeah we, like we don't popcorn. we don't know if that means that like oh they're more they might be more likely to fight if a female's present it doesn't necessarily mean she was watching to see what the outcome was and oh. it would be really it was really it would be super difficult to determine that but <laughs> it would be worth looking at so what are what are some uh reptiles that kind of have this ritualistic game that they play and and are do they like are there any variations from just straight up combat? How do how does a snake fight another snake? Do they just wrap themselves around each other and you like, nailed it? Yeah, that's it. Yeah. Really? When you see when you might you might have seen um, snakes where it looks like they're dancing. Where yeah. Two rattlesnakes get up um, and they kind of twine their fronts and they look and it's very ritualized. It looks really cool. Yeah. That's two. That's two male rattlesnakes. Oh, geez. They're fighting. Oh. They're not. They're not. That's not a courtship dance. Hmm. Courtship and pit vipers typically happens flat on the ground, and it's it's kind of weird looking and it's pretty sexy, but it's not this <laughs> really really cool looking dance that males do. So that male combat dance, rattlesnakes and other pit vipers, that's how they do it, and it goes on. It can go on for hours. Wow, where they're wrapped around each other and they're basically it's like a, it's basically an arm wrestling match where they don't have any arms, so they're using their whole bodies to try to push one down over the other, and generally <laughs> the larger snake wins. Oh, the, and that's okay, how the mass, it. the yeah. mass, right? Yeah, it's it's all about mass. It's, you know, same thing in human fights. That's why oh, we yeah. have weight divisions. We have Definitely. weight divisions. But check it out. This is really cool. One of my former mentors figured this out in copperheads. Really difficult to do because snakes are very difficult to study in the wild, very hard to find. So like seeing one incidence of male combat in nature, really hard. 
So in order to do a study where you're really looking at the outcomes of these fights and investigating it, you got to bring them into captivity. That's problem number two, because snakes don't behave normally when you're watching them. They're very shy. They hate being looked at. They don't have any eyelids. Right. Yeah. <laughs> so they they always, have to watch. They're always yeah. looking at you. They always know you're there. So you're going to have to hide from them. So anyway, he, he eventually managed to get enough fights between male copperheads wow. in captivity. And then what he would do is he would, he would try to see what would happen with a female afterwards. So he had a couple of males fight, and then he would introduce females. So after males fight, do we have time to go into this or should we do this after after the Let, segment? Let's over? do this after the break because you got me you got the vision yeah. of me like I'm I'm looking at this like barren arena with sand and on one side there is a a a, a bright up and coming male copperhead, you know, with a little uh with a sash around him, kind of like Spartacus, you know, a little plate mail and stuff. And then on the other side you got the old the old veteran with one eye and he's like been through mm-hmm. all the hard battles and then like right there in the middle there's like the maid you know the the, the <laughs> princess the princess uh, snake with a uh, giant long eyelashes and a long blonde uh, uh wig on and she doesn't have eyelids so she doesn't ever close her eyes but the eyelashes are still there so you, you got me you got me really my imagination That's pretty much going crazy. exactly what he found that's exactly what he found <laughs> All right, let's pick it up right after the break. Hello, everybody. Sean Graham here from the Science Nights. I'm here with Conley Razor, and we're talking about kind of aggression in the animal kingdom, fighting warfare, and we've we've gotten to snakes, and they do ritualized combat for access to females. And Conley just kind of set up a mental image in your head of the of the two knights in shining armor uh, jousting over the lady snake with a big blonde wig. Yep, and it, I, exactly. I'm going to throw a big, a, th- a big cold bucket of water on that because oh, you're going to love this. You're going to love this. It's so great. <laughs> so the males fight over females, and the loser has super high levels of the stress hormone corticosterone, which is the, the reptile version of cortisol, which is the stress hormone that humans have after fights. Uh, people, people have studied uh, the results of fights in humans, boxing matches. Yeah, even the, the even the spectators have this thing called the loser effect. Losers of combat bouts or baseball games or whatever in human societies have significantly higher cortisol levels than the winners. It's really? the loser effect. If you lose a fight, it's why you feel like crap afterwards. It's why you feel like crap after you watch your team lose the World Series, <laughs> Golly. which is what which is what Thomas Schiller is going through right now, and what I'm not going through because the Braves won the World Series. <laughs> oh and yeah, the Astros yeah, lost. Yeah, you had yours. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's true. Uh, I'm glad that's he's true. not here to defend himself. So <laughs> a, a copperhead's the same thing. If it loses a battle, its stress hormone goes uh, through the roof. The winner, meanwhile, does not. This is the really cool part. Okay. Now, if a female approaches a male snake during the breeding season, she will raise herself up off of the substrate, off the ground, and in, in, put her neck up and her, her head up in an arch, and it looks just like the initiation of a combat bout between two males. Oh, She raises herself up. If a male has recently won a fight, he will raise himself up too, to meet her challenge, and then she immediately raises herself back down, uh, and they go to town. A subservient posture, and he starts courting. Her. There we go. Here's the thing. Boom. Here's the thing. If you recently lost a battle and you're a copperhead, and the female raises herself up to challenge you, you will actually demure and turn around and run. Whoa! So the it's female like a pride has, system. You can't fake it. The, the female has figured out a way to kind of exploit the male combat to choose winners. Wow. Isn't that, oh, cool? that is absolutely amazing. Now, you said yeah. the losers uh, have this spike of cortisol. Yeah. What does that do to their biology? Like, what, how does that affect their biology? I mean, in the, in the, long, t- in the long run, it could kill them. You know, if you had high levels of corticosterone for months and months, your body would deteriorate, your immune system would be compromised, you die. 
Oh um, man! But in the sh- in the short term, it's just it probably just makes them feel like crap. Their physiology is out of whack. Their immune system would probably take a hit. Jeez. It lasts for a cu- it lasts for a couple of weeks, which is pretty crazy. And and this is interesting Dang. because in more copperheads are about the least social animal you could ever study. Yeah, they don't hang out together. They don't have you know societies. They don't have you know ranks. They're super solitary except during breeding season. And, uh, and so it lasts like a week. They they don't, they don't, you know, they're not sophisticated in social animals. Those kind of stressful interactions don't affect them as much. When you, when you lose a baseball game or a fight, you're up and at them and ready to rock and roll after you've shaken it off and maybe had a couple of beers the next day and your cortisol levels will not be exceedingly high for very long. You'll get over it quick because you're a social animal, social animals, get good at those kind of you know aggressive interactions agonism you know your, your subservient behaviors or aggressive behaviors you all get good at it and, and and you know generally humans are pretty good at dealing with social stress yeah um, yeah uh, people who are super stressed out and are experiencing super big problems are all laughing at me right now saying no nah, i'm not very good at it but you know you are you're better than a copperhead <laughs> better than than I'm just glad I'm not a Browns fan. <laughs> so I mean, golly, yeah. I, I well, can't imagine it? the the. I, I, there's got to be a study on Browns fans now, like their their yeah. their life expect expectancy. It could be, yeah. yeah. Detroit is it Detroit right now? Who the Detroit Pistons and the <laughs> Detroit Lions have have never won a game this season? Oh, is that is that true? I don't know. Something I don't like keep that? up with yeah. uh, I don't keep up with the the tribal sports really. I like the one on ones personally, uh, and yeah, that's I, what I, really that's that's cool. Yeah, that yeah, yeah like tennis. To be said tennis for that. is always cool. Like the the one on one, the one match, you know. And there's coaches behind, like around all these like individuals. Right. Mm-hmm. And, and, yeah. you know, they have almost their own little tribe. Like for a lot of these fighters, they are, they are part of a bigger camp, like which, which is like a camp of warriors. Right. And they all have their own code and they all have their own ways of doing things. They all have their own analysis and then they get in the ring and it's one on one, but it's really one camp against the other, which kind of brings it back to our own animal kingdom in that, you know, you have one tribe versus another tribe or another one species, like two, two predatory species fighting over that piece of prey and only one prevails. So is it possible if you say you were on Australia, right? Mm-hmm. What What is the apex predator in Australia right now? Oh, it's pretty shameful. It's um, it's really it's the dingo. The dingo, Dingo's, the dog, ding, dingo, and and wedge-tailed eagles are about as big as they get here anymore. Um, wow. But that's kind of an unnatural situation. Um, Sounds you like know, they yeah there there were larger predators up until pretty recently that have been driven to extinction. Mm. Um, Australia has the highest rates of extinction for mammals of any any continent. Wow, um, yeah. So, so they're changed. They're real diverse. Yeah, there used to be really big cool predators here there were used to be uh monitor lizards bigger than komodo dragons wow. in, during the last ice age <laughs> good lord yeah there were big you know dog size and and you know lion size predators but they're they're all gone wow so yeah the biggest thing around now is the dingo and at least the dingo has had um you know it's been here for a while so most of the mammals that are here have kind of gone through a co-evolutionary process with the dingo the big problem are two introduced predators that have been got that got here recently that haven't had a very quick you know the coevolution is going on right now they're driving a lot of things to extinction foxes and and house cats huh. are significant predators on the native uh you know marsupials that are here and it's oh, pretty man. shameful yeah Golly, they're, get, they're get rid of those cats get rid of those cats yeah get them get them out of there but uh all right well okay that wasn't quite you know what where i was going with that but that's okay because what did you what, what did you what would you want to say what, what did you think the apex predator was well not, not in australia i thought there was something like a cat or like here in the high desert we have the mountain lion and that's yeah. it like that thing yeah. is 
the and they all look exactly alike. They're all designed right. with that perfect structure, and there's no nothing that can ever give them any kind of competition. They got it. They have it all, except for yeah, men. Even in West you know, Texas, though, there used to be there, they used to have competition, and they were subservient predators. They were they do uh, mountain lions take second chair when they're when they're around uh, grizzlies, around gray wolves, around oh, jaguars. Okay, so they're actually they're not they are an apex predator when they're the only game in town, but they oh. weren't the only game in town just 120 years ago. Yeah, uh, there were there were much you know there we had wolves. At least there was a grizzly in the Davis Mountains. Uh, so there was there was bigger things around. Probably jaguars every now and then probably came through town. And I'm hearing jaguars uh, are kind of making a comeback. They are. They're they're coming back. Um, they're popping up in South Arizona. They're back. Um, you you know and and then the rest of the Southwest. You know we kind of think of jaguars as oh they probably it was probably just like transient males that moved into new no there were breeding jaguars um there was a a female and a cub killed at the grand canyon whoa like um you know in historic times yeah like newspaper i think there might even be a photograph of that cat and her wow. cub wow so there it, it wasn't just you know widely ranging males which is mostly what we're getting in in southern arizona now Wow. Um, but eventually, you know, if a female gets there, uh, we could have we could have breeding populations again. Yeah, that would be interesting. And that's just uh, another reason why there's this constant competitive edge that these different animals are trying to get over each other. So that really does it for our show. Is there anything you'd want to wrap up with, Sean? Um, don't get in fights. It's <laughs> okay. not like the movies. Don't you get know? in fights. It's not don't like the movies, fights. but uh, if, don't you know, lose. You, you might lose. You might lose and you'll feel bad. Yeah. Yeah. And instead you should be, you should, everybody should just make love, make love, not war people. Come on. Peace. <sighs> but war's so fun. It's, <laughs> it's fun to think about, fun to read about, fun to watch. Yeah. But you don't want it. You don't want it. <laughs> That's true. You don't want it. That's it's true. never like it is in the movies. It sucks. Yeah, we can vicariously experience it through uh, sports and movies and TV shows and video games and all that other That's stuff. It. So, That's so that it. that'll work. And then you know, in the real world, we can all love each other and watch and be good. watch Predator, watch the movie Predator with Arnold Schwarzenegger. Oh yeah, yeah. You know, yeah. And then go make love, not war. There we go. Sounds like a a, a Netflix night <laughs> for Sean Graham and the Graham household. So there we go. <laughs> <laughs> all right that's another episode of science nights in the morning we'll see you next week episode when we will all be assembled catch you then thanks for listening to this episode of science nights in the morning be sure and follow us on patreon for exclusive gear and uncut episodes check out the latest science articles on our facebook page and subscribe to us on youtube and your favorite podcast listening app you can also listen every saturday at 10 a.m central standard time at bigbenradio.com and if you got a question we'll join the discussion hit the hotline at 432-217-1983 and record your message we couldn't do this without you, and thank you so much for listening each and every week. That's Science Nights in the Morning with a K, and we'll see you next time.